few words so uh, how the seminar we are starting now with some uh, regular sessions uh, we plan to have uh, about two sessions every month uh, starting uh, I mean in March uh, which is <laughs> this month we have only one session but uh, <clears throat> next month and uh, until the end of uh, 2021 we will have uh, two uh, sessions uh, every month we already have uh, nearly the, the complete table on the on the website. We will just make some uh, small adjustment updates, but the program is uh, nearly full. So uh, for each uh, session, uh, there will be a chairman. Today it's me because it's the first session and I am uh, the organizer of the webinar and uh, the editor of Logic Universalis. But then each session, there will be a different chairman, generally a member of uh, the detailed board of Logic Universalis or the, the book series Studies Universal Logic. And uh, before the talk, as today, we will have uh, the presentation of uh, logical organization, logical society, logical group uh, related to the topic of the talk or to the speaker. So uh, today, since we have a speaker from uh, Norway, uh, we have the pleasure to um, welcome uh, Valentin Boenko, who uh, is the president of the Scandinavian Logic Society. And um, we'll say uh, a few words about this uh, logical society, the activity of this uh, organization, uh, in logic in Scandinavia, and so on. So, uh, Valentin, you are welcome to, to talk. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve. And, uh... Hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, all right. So yeah, thanks for this opportunity. I'll be very brief. Actually, I had a couple of slides uh, uh, prepared here. Can I share my slides? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can show your slides, of course. Let's see. Uh, can you see them? Yep. OK, good. So uh, this will be a very short presentation of the Scandinavian Logic Society, and uh, I'll start with a geographic remark. So different people mean different things by the Scandinavian region. Well, uh, we take it in a broad sense, that is for the whole sort of Northern uh, European uh, region, as you can see it on the map. Okay. Uh, now, uh, a few words about the logic traditions in Scandinavia. So. I must admit that I don't know the early history, well, let's say before the 20th century, that is something yet to be investigated. I couldn't uh, find any sources on that. If anyone knows anything, Ture or anyone else, then uh, please share with me. But um, <clears throat> as far as I know, the studies of modern logic uh, in the Scandinavian region started about 100 years ago uh, with the work of the um, well-known uh, Norwegian mathematician, logician Thorolf Skolem, who is uh, well, very well known with some uh, very important uh, results in, in logic, including the Lovenheim's column theorems, the Skolemization method, and so on. So, um, well, uh, briefly, logic in Scandinavia has been developing since then uh, quite actively in all three major directions of logic. Uh, namely philosophical, mathematical, and, and computational. And uh, I'll not take uh, much time to, uh, to outline these developments. I'll just mention a few names of uh, famous world quad logicians which are uh, no longer living, uh, but still they are notable names that I should mention here as, well, let's say, forefathers of uh, logic in, in uh, Scandinavia. So in, on the philosophical side, those would include uh, von Wricht, Jakob Hintiker, Leonard Ockwist, Tick Kanger, and a number of others. Uh, on mathematical logic, for instance, uh, Per Lindström, Jens Erik uh, Fenstad, a number of others. Uh, there are, of course, many more famous logicians living around, but I will resist the temptation to list the uh, famous living logicians because the danger of Omitting important names is, is very great, and I don't want to do that, but I'm sure that you know many. So uh, anyway, uh, let me just mention this as the um, kind of more recent news that uh, last year, Doug Pravitz and Per Martin Love 
were jointly awarded the prestigious uh, Wolf, Stock, uh, Wolf Shock sorry, Prize in uh, Logic and uh, Philosophy. Okay. Now, a few words about the society itself. So uh, before the society was actually um, founded, established, uh, there were already uh, quite active uh, logical activities in the region, including uh, there was a series of seven Scandinavian logic symposia, first one uh, in 1968, and then the last one in 1996, and thereafter uh, this, uh, for some or other reasons, this tradition, this series was uh, disconnected. Uh, so that about 10 years ago, uh, a few, let's say, logic enthusiasts uh, decided, including myself, decided to renew that tradition and to kind of institutionalize it by establishing uh, a Scandinavian logic society. And so it was uh, officially founded uh, in uh, 2012 at the 8th Scandinavian Logic uh, Symposium, which was then organized in Roskilde in Denmark. And the uh, society currently has at least 150 members. We are actually currently doing a membership update and it's still in a process, so I can't give you precise figures, but it's, it's quite a healthy number. And uh, so we are quite happy with the uh, interest in logic in the region. And uh, of course, not all these members are uh, well, live or work in the Scandinavia. Uh, in fact, the membership is open worldwide to uh, everyone who is anyhow affiliated with logic and who agrees with and supports the objectives of the society. And importantly, there are no membership fees, at least so far. <laughs> okay, so uh, briefly on the main activities, the main current activities of the uh, society. So first, this is the uh, Scandinavian Logic Symposium, which we restarted or we continued that tradition. And there were, so far there have been uh, 10 events. Uh, and the next one will hopefully be held in, in Bergen, in Norway, uh, either in August or in early December this year. It was actually scheduled to take place last year, but because of the coronavirus pandemic, we had to postpone it. And it's still not clear whether uh, and when uh, it can take place life. Uh, so this is all conditional. Then there is also this uh, uh, series of Nordic logic summer schools, of which there have so far been uh, three of them organized. And the first one was actually 2013 in again in Norway, in Northfjord 8, in a beautiful area up there in the mountains. And uh, the next one will hopefully again will take place in Norway, in, Ber in Bergen, as uh, co-located with the Scandinavian Logic Symposium, and again, the same uh, conditions and uncertainties apply. And uh, just to mention this recently launched monthly event, the Nordic Online Logic Seminar, which got off to quite a strong start uh, on Monday uh, with a talk by Doug Pravitz, and there were more than 160 participants who participated, and uh, well, my Zoom crashed then for the first time ever. So uh, anyway, if you want to see or uh, know more, then go and visit the uh, website of the society and uh, we'll welcome new, new members. That's all for me. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> if someone has some uh, question about this uh, society. Uh, uh, let us. me just add this, that yep. as you can see from the last slide, Bergen is uh, one of our hotspots for doing logic and logic related activities so that I'm, I'm quite pleased and happy to be able to actually welcome Ture, whom I don't know in person yet, but he's yet another logician in Bergen that I discovered. I already know about a dozen of them and they seem to be kind of unrelated with each other, but it, that seems to be a very, very strong logic center. So look forward to your talk. Okay, very good. So, uh... If there is no question, uh, we'll start uh, the talk, now the presentation, uh, by uh, Thor Ugart, sorry for the pronunciation of your name. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, um, he will uh, present a paper which uh, was recently published in uh, Logic Universalis. Uh, 
uh, we will have uh, quite a lot of papers talk uh, related with papers recently published in the journal. And um, the talk is about 30 minutes. And after the talk, there will be a discussion during 15 minutes. So the title of the talk is Farewell to Suppression Freedom. You're welcome to start your talk. Too. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Val, for your introduction. Um, so so um, hopefully you can all see my, my slides. Uh, do let me know if, if not. Um, so as you can guess from the, the title, this is sort of a, a negative assessment of a, a tradition. Um, and let's see if I, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's about uh, what I call the Routley School of Relevant Logics. So very briefly, um, the uh, um, relevant logic is divided into two schools of thought. It's the original Anderson Belknap school, and there's the uh, rebellious or uh, Routley school. So the, the Routley school, um, they, they favored logics that were, uh, that are weaker than Anderson and Belknap's well-known logics, E and R. Uh, they did up, uphold, uphold the, the variable chain property, but they regarded it as less important. And the other criteria, the use criteria, they completely abandoned. In its place, they they, uh, they introduced a concept which they called suppression uh, and argued that logical consequence ought to be viewed as a sufficiency relation. And as such, it should be analyzed as a, as a relation free from what they call then logical suppression. So uh, the purpose of this talk is to, to give a presentation of this notion uh, and, uh, and then to present some of those results from, from my paper. So uh, the presentation will be hopefully at least uh, uh, accessible for those of you who are unfamiliar with the relevant logics, uh, but I'll, I'll try to present at least some of the results. Uh, but, uh, Proofs and such are, are to be found in, in my paper. So, so let's uh, talk a bit about the background on, on relevant logics first. First, you see here Anderson uh, on the left and Belknap on the right. Uh, so they, um, their goal was to find a, a, a theory of entailment or logical consequence. So, uh, so one of the main tenets uh, um, was that entailment uh, should be viewed as an object language conditional. So that uh, is sort of different from the usual uh, meta language approach to, to logical consequence. Um, so they, they argued then that the material, the intuitionistic as well as the strict condi conditional weren't up to the task. So it was uh, um, yeah, so, so the basic argument uh, that runs through uh, the writing is that, is that these type of conditionals, they uh, express implicational paradoxes when read as uh, expressing entailment. So, so uh, roughly an implicational paradox is a statement to the effect that unrelated propositions are bound together by the re relation of logical implication. So, so as an example is the, the Kleene axiom here, uh, that a contradiction A and not A entails B or not B. So, so even though they, they uh, did uh, um, regard contradictions as logically false and, and B or not B as logically true, these propositions, um, they seem to express uh, different different propositions, different unrelated propositions. And so claiming that they are, they are bound together uh, by the relation of entailment would be, uh, according to them, to commit a fallacy of relevance. So, so to guard against such paradoxes, they set up two, two criteria. The first one uh, is a meaning relatedness criteria, that, that if a proposition A is to entail a proposition B, 
then A and B uh, has to be meaning related somehow. And the other one is uh, a criteria of der derivational utility. That is that uh, if A entails B, then, then you have to somehow use A in order to obtain B in a proof. Or, so so uh, Anderson and Bell stressed that that these uh, criteria they they uh, ought to be formalized they, they have to be formal criteria so the the uh, letter derivational utility one they they formalized it as uh, what is known as the entailment theorem that a arrow b is logically true if and only if a entails b so entails here is a technical notion so their favorite sorry th their favorite um way of specifying it was using a, a Fitch calculus. Um, whereas the meaning relatedness criteria um, was formalized um, using the variable sharing property. So that's from uh, Belknap's 1960 paper. Um, and it's this, um, logic A has the variable sharing property just in case for every formula A and B. A arrow B is logically true only if A and B share a propositional parameter. Um, so, so before I go on, um, I want to just show you very briefly how the logic E is pieced together. So, so here it's 14 axioms. Uh, they are relatively straightforward. What, what is uh, worth noticing is the axiom 9, 10, 11, and up to 14. Um, these I will get to back to later. But they are uh, some transitivity axioms, axiom 9, nine and 10. Um, there is a reductive axiom, contraction ax axiom, and there's two uh, distinctive E axioms. So axiom 13 and 14 um, are are sort of what, what's peculiar with, with uh, the logic E. It makes E into a modal S4 type logic. So it, if you add uh, the permutation axiom here to E, you obtain the logic R. So those two logics were the Anderson Belknap uh, um, uh, classical logics. Uh, if you add this, that A uh, entails that B entails B, you actually obtain the, the classical model logic S4. And if you add the, the uh, weakening axiom here, you obtain classical logic. So one of Routley's favorite logics is called DK. And you obtain that logic by weakening the pre and suffixing axioms to rules. And you replace the reductive axiom by excluding middle. And you, you replace the contraction axiom by the axiom known as, uh, um, it's called uh, uh, conjunctive syllogism. Um, and then you delete the E distinctive axioms. Um, so um, the Routley School, they, they thought of the, the uh, Anderson and Belknap selection criteria uh, as inadequate. They, um, they thought that First of all, they, they are inadequate for delivering E and R. Um, and, and, um, and the main argument here was that simply that, that these criteria, they apply to stronger logics. Um, but they are also inadequate in guarding against what's, what really matters. Uh, and that is not implicational paradoxes, but logical suppression. Um, so, so the Routley judgment then was that the use criteria uh, of relevance, um, they simply abandoned it. Um, they, they, they thought that um, they simply uh, offered little or no discriminatory power uh, without giving a proper proof, but, but that, that was their judgment. Um, whereas the meaning criteria of relevance um, was upheld. They, they did regard it as, as important. Um, so here's a quote, the, the weak relevance, um, and by that they simply mean uh, uh, the variable sharing property. 
it's not a fundamental matter of entailment, but a derivative feature of a good sufficiency rate relation. It provides an extremely important formal test of adequacy. Um, but um, uh, so so uh, and furthermore, the, the implicational paradoxes are still unacceptable. But then, um, and here's a further quote. Uh, Though elimination of suppression eliminates the paradoxes, elimination of the paradoxes uh, and of relevance violations does not guarantee absence of suppression because certain limited kinds of suppression do not lead to relevance violations. Therefore, the satisfaction of relevance re requirements is not itself sufficient for guaranteeing suitability of an implication for interpretation which requires suppression freedom. So it's important, it just don't, doesn't get to the heart of the matter. That's their, their uh, overall judgment. So, so um, the Radley School, um, who, who belongs to the Radley School? So, so first and foremost, it's Rickard Sullivan. He, he was formerly known as Rickard Radley. Uh, and it was his uh, Val Plumwood, who was married to, to Rickard for some time. Uh, so formerly known as Val Routley, um, and they co-authored um, a paper that's known as the, um, the Semantic of First Degree Entailment. It's best known for the, the semantics, uh, for in, the Routley star semantics for, for interpreting negation. Um, it's also, that paper is also the first uh, from the Routley School on su suppression. The, the uh, the whole idea of logical suppression seemed to go back to Val uh, and not Rickard. Uh, she, she read a paper in St. Andrews in 1967 called Some False Law, Laws of Logic, which I uh, alas, haven't been able to read, but as far as I can tell, at least they, it's uh, the, her idea of uh, the logical suppression idea is hers. Um, so the notion of suppression freedom is is more uh, detailed in um, in the, the book 1982 book relevant logics and their rivals uh, and that book is um, its main author is Rickard Sullivan uh, and Val and Robert Meyer and Ross Brady are co-authors. So here is the the picture actually from the dust uh, jacket. Uh, you see here uh, Routley, no, Rickard Routley as the, the lead figure and Val following him. And then there's Maya and Ross Brady. Uh, so, so I should note that, that Maya, uh, he seemed not to have endorsed the suppression accounts uh, in his own writings. Brady, on the other hand, he, he does state in the sequel book to, to uh, the relevant logics and the rivals too. Um, he states in, in the introduction there that some, some, some uh, suppression is in fact benign um, and that suppression freedom is in any case insufficient for reaching what he called the depth relevant logics. So yeah, he seemed to uh, have endorsed it at least halfway, but yeah, it, the, the main idea seems to, seems to be um, um, Routley and, and I mean, Rickard and, and Val's ideas. Um, so, so what is logical suppression then? Um, so the, the term suppression is also used by Anderson and Belknap uh, in their paper on entry memes. So if you consider a two premise valid argument from M and B to C, but which is such that the argument is invalid if you take away B, um, so that is basically what Anderson and Belknap understand by an entry memo. It's sort of a valid argument where it bought for a missing pre premise. So Anderson and Belknap then argument, argued that since the argument from M and B to C is valid, the conditional, which then is thought of as expressing entailment, ought to be true as well. Um, but since the argument from M alone to C is invalid, the, the uh, sentence M entails B ought not to be true. 
Um, however, uh, in both classical and intuitionistic logic, uh, this argument here is valid. And in S4, it's also valid uh, as long as B is, uh, is a necessary proposition. So, so here's a quote uh, then from the paper. But, but to say that the argument from M to, M to C is thus valid, which they, they, they thought of the, the last sentence uh, as expressing that M, the argument from M to C is valid. Um, to say uh, thus is valid is in direct contra contradiction to the doctrine that antimatic uh, arguments suppress required premises. Um, so, um, um, so neither of these conditionals, according to Anderson and Belknap, uh, can express logical implication. Um, so if logical implication proper is to be expressible and not merely anti-mematic implication, then we need a new type of logic or new type of, of conditional. And their uh, account was then the, the ease conditional uh, do a better job. So, but then one can ask that if, if, um, if E in any, uh, does, is E completely free from suppression itself? Um, or, and also what kind of, so, so the argument form here can't be valid, but, but what kind of instances can be valid? Are all instances invalid or what, yeah. So what is the criteria then for judging a, a particular argument? So, so uh, uh, Anderson and Belknap's uh, judgment then was that uh, E is the, like the perfect logic. Uh, as long as we, uh, we are very careful and always put down all the premises we need, if we uh, argue logically, then we arrive precisely at the formal system E of logical implication or entailment. Um, so that um, irritated the roughly, uh, especially roughly enormously uh, that, that the criteria should, should pick out E particularly somehow. Um, according uh, to him, or at least the roughly school, uh, E harbors uh, suppressive principles. Um, so to investigate this, we need a, a more precise notion of logical suppression. Um, can such a notion uh, be precisified so as to be comparable to the formal criteria of Anderson and Belknap, and in particular the variable sharing property? That's one question. Um, the other question is: it, Will such uh, will it show then that E is in fact suppressive? And the last uh, question that I've been trying to answer then in, in my paper is the is it uh, is whether the variable sharing property will will show up as a derivative feature of it. Um, so both Anderson and Belknap and and Routley use the the suppression term in in a rather uh, intuitive way, but in in the uh, relevant logics and the rivals book in the, the first one. They do provide two principles that are um, easily made into formal properties. The first one is the anti-suppression principle, and the other one is called the joint force principle. And the the first one, the the anti-suppression principle, uh, reads as, as follows: For every statement p, there is some statement q such that the consequences of q are a proper subset of the joint consequences of p and q. There is no privileged class of statement which are generally suppressible. Now, consequences of here can't uh, mean Hilbert derivability since logical theorems are suppressible for this notion of consequence. Um, so my suggestion then, um, and I should underline that this is my suggestion uh, and not theirs, is, is to, to uh, regard the anti-suppressive principle as, as this uh, one here. So a logic L set satisfies the anti-suppression principle, just in case for every formula A, there exist formulas B and C, such that uh, the sentence A and B entails C is logically true, but the sentence expressing that B entails C is not. Um, 
So using that, that principle, uh, one can then show that no logic which satisfies it can um, validate these three sentences as logically true. Um, so all, all of these three are regarded as implicational paradoxes. So that's a, a, a good start at least. Um, so the question then is, is whether it rules out all the implicational paradoxes. And the answer is regret regrettably no. But let's uh, look at the, the um, joint force principle first. So the quote uh, again from the same book is, um, for every proposition P there is some other Q such that P and Q are jointly sufficient for R, but neither P nor Q on its own is sufficient for R. It tells us that the joint consequences of propositions may be more than the sum of the cons consequences of each. So formalizing this in the same, same way, we get the, what I call the joint force principle. Um, and it's, uh, if you look at it, it simply adds a conjunction. Uh, it adds the conjunction that uh, A, arrow C shouldn't be logically true. Uh, otherwise it's, it's the same principle. Hence, um, it's obviously stronger. Uh, if it's properly stronger, uh, uh, I'm in doubt, but I haven't found a counter uh, example yet. Um, but it turns out that the joint force principle is implied by what's known as the weak variable sharing property. And that's the property that um, says that uh, if A arrow B is logically true, that can only happen if either uh, A and B share a propositional parameter or both uh, not A and B are logically uh, are logical theorems. So that's a, a, a proper, proper weaker uh, principle than the, the variable sharing property. Um, so, so at least so far, at least uh, formal suppression formalized by, by the joint force principle is strictly weaker than Anderson and Belknap's variable sharing property. Um, and uh, one of the principles that, that the weak variable sharing property does not roll out is the Kleene axiom. Uh, but worse, um, the joint force principle is even properly weaker than the weak variable sharing property. So that's, um, um, it turns out that, that you can add all these four axioms to E uh, and still have a logic that satisfies the joint force principle. But um, the first one of these uh, uh, can't hold in any logic that satisfies the weak variable sharing property. Because if, if it did, then the negation of A implies A would have to be logically true, which usually isn't. Um, whereas the number two, three, and four here, um, neither of those are ruled out by, by the weak variable sharing properties. Oh, oh, all of those, the, the latter three are actually theorems of the logic called R, R with mingle. So that's a, um, so, so the conclusion then um, so far is that um, the anti-suppression, the, the formal anti-suppression principles, um, they, they fail to uh, do away with the implicational paradoxes. And they yield a notion of logical, um, they fail to yield a notion of logical implication for which the variable sharing property is what the Rudleys uh, uh, thought of as a derivative feature. And it fails then to, to show E up as a suppressive logic. Um, so the, the rest of, of my talk is, is a brief, uh, description of the of section six of my paper. Um, so, so Routley um, used the notion of suppression in obviously many different, uh, different ways, uh, ways that, that are evidently not covered by the anti-suppression principle or the joint force principle. 
Um, so, um, so what they 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 make then two substantial claims uh, in this regard. The first is that um, there are stronger logics than Anderson and Belknap's ENR, which are clearly suppressive. Um, and the other one is that E and R are themselves suppressive. So uh, let's uh, look at these in turn. So the first cl claim um, uh, is that, um, so, so the Routleys, they, they, uh, they actually show that, that you can, uh, can have stronger logics which do satisfy uh, the variable sharing property. They go to extreme lengths to, to, in order to show this. Um, so they investigate. Um, uh, anyway, so, um, but the claim then is that you can add this rule here um, to ENR and still have logic that satisfies the variable sharing property. So notice, first of all, it, it has sort of a, a permuted uh, um, premise here. So it says that if A implies that B and D implies D, uh, those two <laughs> implies C, that, then you can sort of suppress the D uh, implying itself um, in the conclusion. And, and they, they give a, a, a proof of this, but if you look at the proof, uh, then it, it, it's obvious that it, obvious that it is wrong. Uh, and if you look at the rule, uh, it's easily seen that actually you can obtain this A arrow, B arrow, B uh, as a logical theorem using that rule. So, so it's impossible to have a logic uh, E, R, whatever, um, and add this rule and still have the variable sharing property. Um, um, so then we're left with the, the other claim that, that E and R are, are themselves suppressive. So, so actually they, they, the E axiom here, it's called suppression. Uh, so that's a sort of rhetorical, uh, um, but the reason then for, for, for calling it that axiom suppression uh, is that the, it's sort of obtained from this, uh, this identity instance by suppressing the a arrow a uh, instance in the in the consequence. Um, so they claim then that a more detailed examination of the characteristics uh, and principles of systems E and R confirms this presumption. Uh, both systems contain many incorrect and defective principles and qualified suppression principles. So some of the things that are wrong, according to the Radleys with ENR, um, is, uh, should be attributed to other uh, factors, not suppression factors. So, so the contraction axiom, uh, for instance, is to be ruled out because it the contraction trivializes uh, naive theories. And Radley wanted naive set theory, for instance. So, so contraction has to go um, but he did not regard the contraction as a suppressive principle. It just ruled out too many uh, logical, logically consistent scenarios uh, was basically his argument. Um, so, um, but if you look then at the, the, uh, the way that uh, suppression is, is uh, uh, um, viewed at here, um, you sort of get get that um, it's the same type of uh, um, principle that is uh, appealed to as as in the anti-suppression principle. It's just that the the um, the um, premises are, are uh, entailments. They they are uh, they are um, sorry they are antecedents and not conjunctions. Um, so. So that uh, got me the idea that, well, we could try to, to have an intentional version of these principles. Um, so this is simply the, the joint force principle, but with the 
antecedents. Uh, um, and then you can uh, ask the same type of question again, uh, if, if this principle or it in conjunction with the, the extensional version of it um, is sufficient to, to rule uh, E and R as oppressive logics. And it turns out that uh, at least the Routley's favorite logic, or at least one of them, does satisfy both these principles. And it does rule E as a suppressive logic. Um, um, however, um, it is not sufficient. Uh, these two principles in conjunction are not sufficient uh, for ruling uh, out the implication of paradoxes. Um, so, uh, so for instance, the, the, the Kleene axiom may still not rule out. Uh, so my findings here is basically that the notion of suppression is both, both too imprecise and used in too many uh, different senses. Um, the most obvious way of turning these principles into formal properties yield properties weaker than advertised. And in particular, the variable shank property need not hold, even though the logic in question satisfies the properties of suppression freedom. Um, so in conclusion, Anderson and Belknap uh, argued that in order to differentiate between valid arguments and entry members, the logic should not allow one to infer M entails B from M and B entails C together with the truth of B. Um, so no logic can in fact valid with the variable sharing property can in fact validate this rule. Um, but roughly at all, they, they seem to suspect any, any instance of that argument uh, as an instant of suppression. Um, so as an example, they, they, uh, um, they came to suspect that even this sentence here that C, that if C entails both A and B, then C entails A. That, uh, and that the Routleys, they, they, they thought that maybe there's even here a suppressed premise, the, the logically true A and B arrow A might be suppressed. Uh, and if so, then, then even uh, very weak uh, rules ha have to go. But at this point, uh, my sort of conclusion of my essay is that um, as arguments go and as uh, it, it simply seems uh, that uh, it's burden of, of the roughly tradition, uh, any adherent of, of a suppressive account of entailment um, to specify such that uh, um, such that uh, it's possible to evaluate it in, in uh, um, and then to evaluate the, the claim that, that suppression is the, the basic feature. Uh, but uh, having not found any such uh, account or, or proper argument, I um, sort of bid farewell to suppression freedom. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, I must say that we don't have many people from uh, Australia today or New Zealand because, uh, uh, I mean, we have chosen uh, this schedule because it's good for everybody except these people because uh, in nowadays, it's, uh, now it's three o'clock in, uh, three in the morning in Sydney, I see, and five in the morning in uh, Auckland. But anyway, I see that uh, David Mackinson or Jenny from Australia is here. It's a good point. And of course, not only people from Australia and New Zealand are interested in, uh, in uh, this kind of question about relevant logic. So uh, now the discussion is open. Someone wants to make a question.
think it's a topic that not uh, much people know or are working on nowadays, but uh, it's quite interesting. If someone wants to make a, uh, also a question uh, by uh, on the conversation by writing, can I ask a question or make? A yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's 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 partly related to what you present here, but uh, uh, well, uh, many many years ago, when I first learned the uh, Craig interpolation property, I thought that. If any logic is to be called relevant or relevance, then it should satisfy that property at least. And so that uh, and, uh, some 30 years ago, when I came across this, uh, this paper by Urquhart, where he disproved, where he proved failure of interpolation for most of the uh, famous relevance logics, uh, I was quite disappointed. I thought this is an embarrassment for uh, relevance logics. So, I mean, this, uh, you didn't mention interpolation here, but these variable sharing properties, in fact, they, well, it's, it's related and in, under certain conditions, I believe that it's weaker than inter interpolation. So, so my question, if I, if I can uh, state it in a coherent way is, uh, well, first of all, uh, how does in interpolation features in, 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 feature in, in what you're doing? Can, can you say anything in defense of relevance logics without the interpolation property? Oh, <laughs> um, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think I have to be honest to, to, uh, to say no. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret uh, the failure of, of the interpolation property. Um, so, so what I'm generally interested in is in um, uh, how how the both Anderson and, and Belknap and, and the Bradley School went about in in arguing for for the logic. What what was their like selection criteria for logic? Um, and and uh, um, and I mean the the variable sharing property is one of the substantial. Uh, properties that that they do appeal to, but it's still uh, sort of uh, um, under argued uh, why that property has to hold. Um, why is variable sharing property uh, the property that must hold? Um, uh, why can't relevance between antecedent and consequent be cashed out in in other terms? Um, um, yeah, no, but but in terms of, of uh, the interpolation, I, I have nothing interesting to to answer. I'm I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay, more question or, or remarks? Well. Uh, uh, so Richard uh, Sylvan uh, 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 is died since so many years. Uh, I don't know exactly now if there are so many people working on this kind of subject. I've been, uh, Tor, have you been in touch with uh, Ross Brady on this topic? Um, no, no, I haven't. Uh, so he seemed to simply have abandoned it. And that was sort of the, so he, in the, the introduction to the second volume, he seemed to simply abandon it. But he, he says that um, suppression freedom is simply insufficient for, for obtaining what he was after, which was the depth the notion of depth relevance. But he sort of, he abandons it in a way that leaves, uh, leaves the notion some, some substance. Uh, so, but without sort of uh, appealing to the criteria, why, why isn't suppression freedom sufficient? Um, so that got me like sort of, interesting in interested in finding out if there is something sub substantial here at all or if it is because it is a notion that hasn't been appealed to almost i mean priest that uh priest does uh, say in his in contradiction that suppression freedom seems to be what's the heart of the issue uh, but other other than that nobody seemed to have uh, picked up the idea in 
as far as I know, at least. So it, it is sort of a, a, an idea from the 1980s that nobody, uh, nobody um, wrote anything about, but then uh, nobody ever uh, argued that it was an, um, it was a dead end either. So that was sort of my, my idea is to, to pick up an idea and see if I could make something out of it. And if not, then argue that this ought to be left uh, where it was. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, uh, Ross will be interested to, uh, to have a look at your paper. And we will um, also, it's good to remember that we, this uh, session is being recorded. So um, people in, in Australia or New Zealand, uh, now most of them are sleeping, but uh, they can see, they will be able to see the, <laughs> your talk uh, on uh, the YouTube channel. We will uh, we'll put the link on the web page. More questions, remarks? Uh, Jeanif, can you yeah. take my remarks on uh, relevance logics off the record for our Australian friends? Because I don't want to insult anyone's feelings. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, are you recording the discussion as well? Yeah, in principle, yes. Okay. I mean, Ange, I uh, know uh, better than me because she is uh, recording. That's, yeah. that's fine. But uh, yeah, well, then let me put on record that I. I have actually, uh, I mean, very warm feelings for relevance logics. And only recently I got to do my first work on relevance logics. So despite what I say, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. So uh, if there is no, if there are no more co question and comments, um, let me, um, so, uh, remember that, um, as I was saying at the beginning, at, at the start, but maybe not everybody was already here. Uh, so we are starting today the first regular session of uh, our uh, Logic Universalist webinar. And uh, we will have two sessions uh, each month. So next uh, month in April, uh, there will be a session of April 14. I will uh, myself talk on the universal logic uh, events that will take place next year in Crete. And then um, on April 21st, uh, we will have a talk by Stephen Reed on uh, SwissNet, Aristotle and the rule of contradictory pairs. And then uh, we will update uh, the website um, with all the talks and uh, the, the abstract up to now there is only the the one of, uh, because we prepare this just uh, this uh, last uh, days, but soon there will be uh, the list of all uh, the speakers, uh, the abstracts, and uh, the timing of, the, of each talk. Anyone has a comment about the, the webinar? Remarks? So everything is working okay? Technically speaking. <laughs> so um, I would like to thank everybody uh, for coming uh, and uh, Anch Esberg to uh, organize the technical part of this um, webinar and hope to see you uh, soon for the next session in April. Okay. I should bye say bye. thank you yeah. all for listening. Um, no, thank you. For, thank you to all for your talk, of course. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much.